Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode five of Astronomy at Home with Bill Burnett. My name is Chris Miller. I'm a librarian at Coquitlam Public Library. Uh, if you've been following these broadcasts, we've been uh, presenting weekly on different topics, uh, all involving stargazing, trying to locate objects in the sky. And today we're going to uh, talk, uh, sort of focus on the idea of uh, space exploration and technology. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the things that have been put up uh, to gather information in the solar system, uh, efforts to uh, to put astronauts into outer space, a little bit about the International Space Station, uh, and some other things too. So uh, we hope you stick around for the full uh, broadcast. We'd be expecting it'll run about 25 minutes or so. Uh, welcome, Bill. Thank you for joining us again. <clears throat> thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm going to, we've, we've got a bunch of images to share today. So I think I've got my images uh, lined up and we'll use that through the, sh this, the share screen uh, feature. The last time we talked, um, I think right at the end of the episode, I said one of the things that I wanted to ask you this week, and, and it was a question about uh, how people at home using binoculars or a small telescope uh, might be able to find the approximate landing site for the uh, Apollo mission in 1969 that landed on the moon. So I'll let you get started with that. Okay, well, uh, that's a good question. So. Um, one of the things about the, the space program was when they uh, decided to go to the moon, uh, the next, uh, one of the next questions was, uh, whereabouts? And because they wanted to be in continuous contact with the astronauts, that meant that the uh, landing sites all had to be on the near face of the moon. In other words, the uh, part of the moon that's always pointed towards us. There, the moon has uh, a point that's always looking in our direction and then the other side of the moon the far side of the moon is always pointed away so if the astronauts went to the other side they would be out of communication with the ground and there would have been no way to get um, uh, tv shots or pictures of things like that uh, at least live so the best spot it was determined for the first landing it was the middle of the moon so go outside and find the moon and take a look and if the moon is, say, about half full, that's a pretty good time to take a look. I've got a diagram that shows this, in this old astronomy book. So here's the moon here, right? And you see it's, it's half big. Now the landing site is right about here, right? This is where they set down. So it's in the middle of the moon, halfway from the top to the bottom of the visible face of the half moon. So it's just in a little bit. It's in a kind of a, um, a darker area called the Sea of Tranquility, right? and that's where they touch down. Now, you won't be able to see anything because with your binoculars, the smallest thing you can see on the moon is about the size of, well, the city, the lower mainland of BC. Right? That, if that were there, you could just about see it. With a telescope, you can see something the size of uh, Stanley Park, but um, the actual lander that's still there and the uh, flag on the moon and things like that are far beyond uh, any uh, anyone's telescopic uh, view, uh, at least right now. So there's a place to look, and it's um, it's interesting that uh, the footprints and things on the moon will be there for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, because unlike the Earth, the moon has um, has no um, atmosphere and it has no weather. So if you went to the moon and put your handprint in the dust, then that handprint would stay there almost indefinitely, right? Because there's nothing to move it around or, or wipe it away, such as things that happen on the earth. If you go outside on the earth and jump in a mud puddle, well, a couple of days later, your footprints won't be there because they'll be washed away uh, by the water and the waves. But that never happens on the moon. So changes there are permanent. So if we could somehow go there, and look around, we would see exactly what the astronauts saw in 1969 when they left the moon uh, to come back to the Earth. There wouldn't have been any change at all. And you had mentioned, of course, that the, the, the smaller features, like the, the lander that's still there, uh, not there any, uh, I mean, still, still there, but not visible to us 
Uh, but the Sea of Tranquility, it sounds like a quite, quite a visible feature on the moon. So relatively easy to locate using, using binoculars or a small telescope. Yeah, the Sea of Tranquility itself is larger than Vancouver Island. So it's a good chunk of real estate and easily seen uh, with, a, with a pair of binoculars, yeah. And so I'm sharing a picture now. And this is one that was taken from that Apollo mission in, in uh, 1969. So um, I'm presuming then, based on where they landed, that this would be fairly close to where their lander was. Uh, so we're probably gazing from the Sea of Tranquility back towards Earth. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure where where that was, but I, I remember that the moon was below the horizon and then it uh, came up. So they were witnessing a moon ri or Earth rise over the moon. So we, we sometimes see the moon rise over the Earth, but here is a Earth rise over the moon. And as you can see, the, the Earth looks kind of, uh, as you'd expect, bluish and, uh, and with white clouds on it. And the moon is kind of gray. Um, the moon is, is quite a dark object, and if you could walk around on the moon under sunlight, it would look like this. It would be grayish, and when the sun came down, it would be the, the ground beneath your feet would be the color of asphalt, because the, the moon is quite dark. It only appears bright because of the contrast with the absolute brightness that's all around it. So when we think of the silvery moon or the, the bright moon, uh, and, and it is fairly bright, um, but this is a little bit deceptive because the, if you could see the moon with a white piece of paper behind it, you would see, to your surprise, the moon is the color of a dark stone. Yeah. I should just quickly share one other picture here. Uh, this one snapped by Neil Armstrong, I think. So the picture taken right. by Neil Armstrong, but showing Buzz Aldrin on the, on the surface of the moon. You can even see the other, the astronaut who took the picture, he's mirrored in the, uh, in the mask of the first... Uh, astronauts so you can very, see both at the same time yeah good, good observation bill i hadn't i had noticed that but you're right and it and it's uh, it's quite a clear reflection yeah so there they both are and uh, and look at their uh, look at the earth underneath them you can see the footprints of their of their shoes and and as i mentioned uh, earlier that if you were somehow to go there and walk around where this is taken those same footprints would be there in exactly the same way and they would not be uh, uh dusted away or changed in any way right? so they still be there now back back at that time um it was still that was sort of a, an important moment in the space race between the united states and the soviet union um and uh rocket launches were were fairly fairly common things and there was a, I think the source of great patriotism down the, in the United States it was really a competition between those two countries to see what they could mm -hmm. what they could accomplish first before the other country could um, and since then uh, it feels like there haven't been quite as many sort of of those massive event rocket launches I mean there have been some with the space shuttles going up and people will mm -hmm. gather to see the space shuttles take off uh, but it feels like the sort of um, I don't know the like the pace, I guess, of, of launching and competing has sort of slowed down a little bit, but there's perhaps lots of small launches now uh, with, with, uh, with flights going up towards uh, the International Space Station, which is one of the things that we'll talk about uh, sometimes to deliver supplies or to deliver new astronauts or to bring astronauts back down from the space station mm -hmm. uh, back to Earth. Um, so maybe we'll talk about the International Space Station a little bit. Uh, first of all, from a backyard astronomer's perspective, um, I, I know from having, I've, I've looked up in the sky and I'm pretty sure that I've seen the, the International Space Station before. Um, what's the best way to go about uh, trying to locate the International Space Station in, in the sky? How, how easy is it to do? Well, it, it's very easy once you know when it's going to appear. So. The first thing to do is to get a prediction, and that uh, the best way is to go to the websites um, Heavens Above, um, and then look there to see where the space station is. So here we are. This is um, Heavens Above, and you can see a map there with uh, a little yellow uh, icon on it, and that's the um, International Space Station. So the International Space Station is um, not where we can see it because it's um, in between Australia and Antarctica. So I guess it's not all that. Uh, visible, um, unless that maybe it's not really there. That could be just a sort of a place marker picture. Um, but if we click on ISS, we can see a little bit better. 
Okay, so I'm going to move over here, and just so people can sure. follow along, this is again, it's a site called Heaven, Heavens Above. Right, so Heavens Above. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so you guys can, if anyone's interested in, in following it, you can check out this website. And then where I'm going to go next is over in the navigation scheme on the left part of the screen, uh, underneath right. satellites. And there's a little heading there that says 10 day predictions for satellites of special interest. So I'm going to click on ISS for International right. Space Station. And that's going to take us to a page here. Okay. So now we can see 10 days. <clears throat> and the first, um, uh, the brightness, uh, it, which is the first column next to the date, that tells you how bright it is. Now, it's as bright, these numbers tell us that it's as bright as the brightest star in the sky, or even as bright as Venus. So it's not a question of needing telescopes or binoculars. You can see this with the unaided eye, and it looks as bright as or brighter than the very brightest star in the sky. The problem is where it's going to come. And if you look at the on June 10th, you see that at 7.02 uh, p.m., it's coming in the north, northeast, but its altitude is very low. And because in the lower mainland, we have mountains uh, to the north of us, and that's, that's true for uh, Coquitlam and Vancouver. You look behind you and you see the mountains reaching up. So the ISS is going to be hidden behind the mountains, but also at seven o'clock, it will still be light out. So we're not gonna be able to see it this time, but this is the box and the window in which you would see it. So find a date when it's conveniently going to be um, in the evening time, say nine or 10 o'clock at night, or when it's really dark out, and then look to see the altitude, right? That's the, uh, that's the important thing. The altitude you want to be nice and high up. You don't want it uh, scooting along the ground where you won't be able to see it. Um, and then the time will tell you when it appears, the start, and then the end. Generally, it passes from the, um, uh, from the west to the east, right? So if you were standing anywhere in Coquitlam and you're looking towards the Fraser River, you're looking south, and then on your right-hand side, that is where the ISS will appear. So it will come up and look like a bright star, pass over, taking maybe a minute or a minute and a half, and then it will go um, and disappear in the direction of Mission or Chilliwack. Right. So um, because it takes the ISS one and a half hours to go all the way around the Earth, it'll be back again in 90 minutes. So when you see it, go run inside and look at the clock and note the time. Then add 90 minutes to the time. And when that 90 minutes is up, go running out again and take another look. And you can see it twice in one evening. I've done that many times. And as you'd mentioned, it's not, well, it's not always visible. It's sometimes visible in different parts of the world. We do have this way of checking this sort of 10 day forecast. Now it looks like there's arrow buttons as well uh, that allow you to go a little bit ahead. So if you don't see anything in the next 10 days, then you can, it looks like you can go maybe ahead. Cl yeah, click <laughs> ahead and we'll see if it brings up, oh, well, it's got a couple of days, but maybe not a full, not a full 10. So maybe it's only up to a certain point that they've got it. Uh, June 20th is a, is a little bit better, the first one there, because it's very bright. Now the time is a bit of a challenge. It's four in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 420 in the morning, but it should be dark at 420 still, and it's possible, but the dawn will be breaking, so you'll have to, uh, uh, you have to uh, take that into account. If it were a, an hour earlier, it'd be even better. But I think at its brightness, that June 20th might be good if you're willing to get up at four in the morning. <laughs> and uh, of course, if, if the times don't work out, you can, you can just sort of keep, keep this uh, site bookmarked and you can check back That's every right. now and again mm -hmm. and click on it and just see, uh, see what it looks like. Uh, viewing conditions will be like, what the, uh, whether it's in, in our part of the sky, what time, uh, it'll be passing and so on. And you should be able to find that at heavensabove.com. Right. Now I had brought up some mm -hmm. other images as well, because we had, we were talking about the International Space Station, viewing the International Space Station. So um, this is one that I found uh, that I think was just recently uh, uploaded. It may even have gone up today. Um, and it's a picture taken from the International Space Station, just looking past sort of a, uh, a section of it and it's showing uh, the aurora australis so not the northern lights but the southern lights uh, in visible in the southern hemisphere uh, so solar particles 
uh, I guess, colliding with the atmosphere and creating the distinctive colors that we that we know from the northern lights, but in the other part of the world, in the, in the southern hemisphere. <clears throat> That's right. The uh, yeah, this is a very nice display. Um, the southern lights aren't seen as much simply because if you take a, a globe of the Earth and uh, look at it from the direction of the South Pole, you'll see that there's not very much land where people are. You're mainly looking at a ball of water uh, centered by Antarctica. So it's um, uh, these aren't seen as much simply because there are fewer uh, viewers to observe them. Uh, but they're caused by particles that come from the sun. Right now, the sun is approaching a kind of a, a minimum in its uh, energy output, but there have been some northern lights reported in the past few weeks. And it's been a little bit of a surprise because um, it would have been thought that these northern lights would be less frequent or southern lights would be less frequent because of the quiet sun. It's gauged basically to solar output and, and the solar energy that's coming. So, um, of course, it can't really be predicted. It's not like the ISS, which it's known exactly where it's going to be in its orbit and when it goes over top of your house. But this is completely different. This comes about without any uh, ability for us to predict it. It's gauged by the sun, and we don't really understand in even in general terms, how the sun operates inside and how it keeps this uh, machinery of particles going through the solar system. So it's an unpredictable thing, um, whereas so many things in astronomy are parts of cycles. Because things are going around each other, <clears throat> we can say um, there'll be an eclipse in a certain date in 20 years and, and not be in error by even one second. Right? So uh, cycles are, uh, are important for almost all aspects of astronomy, but some things come about that we can't really predict. For example, comets. Um, there's usually a bright comet seen every 15 or 20 years, but the last bright comets were seen in the mid 1990s. So we're overdue for bright comet, but no one can say this will be the year or the next year, or we just have to wait and see. I'm going to bring up another image now, uh, and this will allow us maybe to talk a little bit about about something else. I know that there there has been some recent um, activity with regards to uh, moving astronauts up to the International Space Station, and this isn't a picture uh, showing that exact activity, but it is a picture uh, from the International Space Station showing a couple of different technologies. Uh, one is a supply module, and I think that's a Grumman technology down near the bottom that you can see attached mm -hmm. to the long arm of the Canada arm. Uh, and then up above that and a little bit behind the Cadam, uh, Canada arm is uh, a rocket uh, that is a SpaceX rocket. And so that is uh, connected to the, to the space station. And SpaceX has been uh, active uh, recently with regards to transporting astronauts up to the ISS. And I, I'll just send it over to you, Bill. What, what exactly have they been doing? Well, uh, you know, the SpaceX um, <clears throat> had a launch um, uh, quite recently in the last couple of weeks. And the um, astronauts were uh, taken uh, to the International Space Station on their own uh, on their own rocket, right? So the rocket itself, the first stage of it, comes back to Earth and lands in the middle of the ocean on a, uh, on a platform and is reused. Um, so it's much cheaper than the conventional way in which rockets are generally used once and then ex fall down and, and are expended. So <clears throat> the two astronauts to replace um, or augment the usual crew of the space station were uh, successfully launched into orbit and then they rendezvoused with the um, International Space Station and the two astronauts were uh, welcomed by the three that were there. So there's now a total of five of them um, on, the, on the International Space Station. So this represents the first time a commercial company has done this. So up until now all of the, uh, these uh, activities were done by the US government or the Russian government. So it was a government agency. NASA is, a, is an agency of the government. And um, however, over the past decade and a half, there's been more interest in the private sector doing some of these things. So SpaceX is a private company and uh, now has the capability to do this, uh, to resupply with people the, uh, the International Space Station. They have been already resupplying with supplies. And this is the what we see here, the uh, docking of the 
uh, SpaceX uh, module. So they've been resupplying uh, w uh, material for this space station, but this is the first time that they've actually sent people to the space station. So this demonstrates their ability to do this. And so the next step uh, might be to uh, have a, uh, a larger spacecraft capable of perhaps voyaging to the moon. And this, there again, there's three companies that are bidding to uh, build a spacecraft that would land astronauts on the moon. It's called the Artemis Project. So Boeing is one, SpaceX is another, and there's a third company that I'm, I can't remember. <laughs> and uh, so they all have their, uh, their ideas about going to the moon, what that would look like. And generally, um, it's not too different than how it was done beforehand, but uh, there'd be uh, perhaps larger payloads and um, uh, larger spacecraft uh, going to the moon. And it's possible that this will happen in this decade. So uh, before the, the end of, uh, uh, of the 2020s. Now, I'm being a little bit conservative because some people are pushing for this to happen before 2024. But I think that's maybe a little bit optimistic. So I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm being a little bit more conservative in my, my call, but it could well happen in the 2020s, sometime between now and 2029. I'm guessing that booking a ticket on a voyage like this would be very, very expensive. Well, it, uh, yes it would, but it, it's possible that, uh, that uh, if this becomes a going thing, that the tickets might become well, perhaps uh, in a neighborhood of tens of thousands of dollars, which although it is a lot of money, um, I'm sure there'd be a lineup of people who are willing to spend that kind of money to go. I mean, it's, uh, you know, take out another mortgage on your house and go to space. <laughs> we are living through some amazing times when it comes to, uh, uh, it comes to space exploration. So uh, it'll be interesting to monitor what happens. Uh, the next test, I guess, with the, uh, with the astronauts on board the ISS is that the uh, SpaceX is gonna bring them back down to the planet after they've completed their mission, which uh, from what I understand was of kind of variable length, depending on what they're able to find in terms of work for them to do up on ISS. So it could be from several weeks up to many, many weeks, maybe up to as long as four months, maybe. Uh, but at that point, I guess the test will be to see that the technology works okay, bringing them back down again. And then uh, then it looks like it's full steam ahead uh, if everything goes without a hitch uh, for SpaceX. And that has interesting implications, it sounds like, too, with regards to uh, the, the relationship and partnership between NASA and the Russian Space Agency as well, which has been responsible, I understand, for taking... Uh, astronauts to and from the ISS uh, for a long, long time now. They've been using the Soyuz uh, rockets to do that. Um, so yes. it'll be interesting to see whether that affects relationships between the two countries because they've been strained at times. But the one thing that's kind of always held together, it seems like, is uh, uh, this, this relationship between the space agencies, where I think there has been a real to my eyes, anyway, there's been a sense of partnership between the Russians and the Americans with regards to their uh, to their space missions. That's right. The uh, cooperation in space goes back to the 1970s. Um, however, uh, just because there are private companies involved doesn't mean that there will be no role for the Russians. For one thing, they will probably want to send their own astronauts to the International Space Station. So anyone um, who's a Russian cosmonaut will be going that way. The Americans will want to uh, uh, have their American astronauts leave uh, Earth from the United States in the SpaceX uh, uh, facility. So both of these uh, types of, of movement from the Earth to the ISS can happen at the same time. In fact, there, right now there's a, a Soyuz spacecraft dock to the ISS in addition to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to, to the American uh, module. So the, uh, they're both docked at the same time and uh, uh, so people could come and go with whatever of these two uh, uh, types of spacecraft they wanted. But the plan is for the Americans who have recently come to, uh, to leave by that the same way they came up. And the, that uh, spacecraft is still docked to the ISS. 
So I'm going to go forward a little bit, uh, having talked a bit about the ISS and some of the new things happening with private companies in space. Well, maybe, oops, I'm going back to moon photos. I'm going to quickly go through and go past those for a second. Oops. that before where would this put me aha so i found a different technology now and this is an old uh an old photograph i think maybe dating about about 30 maybe about 30 years old um showing the deployment of the hubble space telescope mm -hmm. and when i think of something that has kind of opened up people's imaginations and their eyes to the sorts of discoveries and beauty, if you will, that exists out in the cosmos. That's, that's the name that I associate with it. Although of course there have been many other things that have been sent into, into space uh, since to capture photographs and maybe some things before as well. But I associate a lot of the really arresting images with the Hubble telescope. Um, tell us a little bit about, about the Hubble bill, if you would. Well, this is, um, <clears throat> this is the device that gives uh, the uh, pictures that everyone has seen. Um, it's a little hard to judge the scale. The space telescope is about the size of a moving van, right? So it's it's about that. It would just you might be able to slide the whole thing into a moving van, but with a little bit of room to spare. So it contains a uh, telescope mirror that's about two meters across, and is uh, those uh, sort of yellowish panels there collect solar energy for power. So that's how the thing uh, re retains its power. So the cameras inside it take a picture and then the picture is sent down to the earth for processing um, at a, a ground station. So this is the device that uh, uh, is giving us all these things. Sometimes I've had people tell me they thought, oh, does the Hubble Space Telescope go to another galaxy or go to a star cluster and then take its picture? Uh, like you'd go to someone's house to snap their uh, their portrait? Well, no, no, <laughs> the space telescope can't go there. It's going around the Earth all the time. And in fact, half the time it's just looking right at the Earth and then can't see anything in space. But then the other half of the time it goes above and below and then uh, is able to take pictures of things. The whole sky is divided up um, into a numbered grid, kind of like the postal codes. If you send a letter to someone, you write their postal code on the letter to make sure it gets there. Well, the sky has such a postal code on it as well, and so when uh, it's desired that the, the telescope takes a picture of a galaxy, that galaxy has a postal code. So the telescope points at the, uh, using the postal code, just like the letter carrier takes your letter to your door, the telescope points at the postal code where the galaxy is, and then the shutter opens and it begins to take a picture. Now, unlike cameras on the Earth, which the shutter only opens for a small amount of time, like a 60th of a second or even less, but the Hubble Space Telescope can have its camera open at an object for uh, hours and hours, or even old days or weeks. So when that happens, then, a lot more light gets through. So the telescope is able to take pictures of things that uh, if you were up there standing on and then looking out, you wouldn't see anything at all. It'd just be a blank place in the sky. But the telescope will see indeed that it's full of, of rich objects. You mentioned with the, the, with the telescope in sort of a constant orbit. Um, is there, I mean, you mentioned it's, it's fairly big, but still small given its distance from us. Is there any way to, to track or see any, uh, any aspect of the telescope as it's going through the sky? Is there, is there the slightest glimmer of light or anything like that? Or is it just so small it's, it's invisible to us all the time, even with, even with a well, telescope or, a, or binoculars? It can, be, it can be viewed, but um, to find the details, you'd have to go back to the previous the Heavens Above website, and the Hubble Space Telescope is there too. So instead of clicking on ISS, click on the Hubble Telescope. And the first column is the magnitudes. And so the magnitudes of the Hubble would be uh, much uh, less, it's fainter than the ISS simply because the, the, telescope, the space telescope is a lot smaller. But it could be visible, um, and you could go out and uh, see it in the heavens, perhaps with your unaided eye or uh, even better with a, a small pair of binoculars. So you could view it, but it, remember, you're not gonna see this. You'll see what looks like a star, 
but it'll be a star that's moving against the background of other stars, and that's the telescope uh, reflecting sunlight from the sun down into your, your, your eye. So it can be done. Yeah, and I guess it's, I mean, it's neat once you know what it is, right? So everyone's looked mm -hmm. up in the sky, and maybe if you've been studying the sky, you've, you've noticed something moving up there, but then wondered what it was. Uh, but this gives you a chance to focus in on a particular part of the sky and then know what you're looking at. And then you can find out more about the Hubble telescope, of course, by looking online or finding pictures to find out what it, what it would look like if you're up closer to it, just like this one here. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to move on now because I had mentioned some of the fantastic pictures that the Hubble uh, telescope has taken. And mm -hmm. I thought I would bring up just one out of countless images that, it, that it's taken to capture things that are far, far away that, as you mentioned, we can't see, uh, but by collecting light over a long period of time, it's able to, to communicate back to, back to us. And, and what are we looking at here, Bill? Well, this is a part of the Star Queen Nebula. It's a famous picture because what it shows is areas where stars are being born. So those dusty, those dark things are um, areas of dust and gas and they uh, collect together there and the gravity of them um, makes a sphere, like it forms into a ball, and then the ball collapses. And as it collapses, it gets hot inside and the heat will eventually form uh, a new star. So this, uh, this is a property of matter that if it's compressed together, if it falls together under gravity, it will generate heat within it. And you can see an example of this if you've uh, ever driven over the Pitt River uh, Bridge to, uh, uh, to the other side, to, to uh, Pitt Meadows. You've done that, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you notice that as you're going over the bridge, there's a large pile of sawdust on one side. You uh, perhaps... So I, it's been long enough that I've done the drive that I that I can't picture it in my head, but but keep going. Yeah. yeah. Well, on the right hand side, there's a very large pile of sawdust, and this always has steam coming out of it, right? And uh, the reason it does is that because it's been moved around by dump trucks and uh, and backhoes, because it's been moved, it has gathered the the energy of motion, but that energy isn't destroyed. So it's retained as heat inside. So the pile of dust and the pile of sawdust gets hot inside. Now that pile is perhaps a couple of acres across. So imagine what would happen if your pile was a um, hundred thousand times as large as the earth, right? When that collapsed, you'd be getting really hot. I'm not kidding. Right? So the temperatures that inside there can grow up to millions and millions of degrees. And when that happens, then you get a new star. But if the glob isn't that big, if it's um, say only 10,000 times as massive as the Earth, then you're going to have a planet like Jupiter or Saturn, something like that. So the size of the glob initially depends whether it's going to be a star or a planet. Star if it's big, planet if it's little, and the Earth is little, 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 really little. <clears throat> All right. So, and I think that's the the end of our images. Uh, I think we've been through each of the things. I'm going to stop sharing with that now. And I've, okay. I've I've kept you. We've been talking for a long time now, so it's a lo longer than the 25 minutes that I that I talked about. Uh, before, but there's been lots of interesting things to discuss. Um, right. One of the things I wanted to bring up before we reach the very end of the episode is the fact that this is uh, the final episode of our of our five week uh, planned uh, episodes for astronomy at home. So um, we look forward to working with with Bill again. I'm going to be uh, sort of seeing how we can collaborate again. Uh, and uh, I had some ideas for maybe uh, talking with him. Uh, during the summer, so we'll see if I can bring something like that about. But there, uh, there is a tie-in for uh, this year's summer reading club. It's called Explore Our Universe, and it includes some some things uh, that you get with your SRC packages that have uh, little bits of uh, information about space history and other facts. And so I thought that might be a nice tie-in, but we don't have anything planned or set in stone yet. But check back on our website to see uh, whether we're able to arrange anything with, with Bill. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to thank him uh, so much for being willing to meet with us uh, over the past 
uh, over the past several weeks. It's been a lot of fun discussing things, learning lots of things that I didn't know. Uh, I have an interest in astronomy, but my knowledge level is limited. Uh, I took one course in university and it was a long, long time ago. I have met an astro astronaut once. I was very excited about that uh, back when I worked as a newspaper person. I met a guy named Bjarni Trygvason. And uh, that, it, it sort of reinforced this perspective that I have now. It was fun to talk about space exploration as the, on the final episode, uh, but I think astronauts seem like some of the most well-adjusted people that I've, you know, that, that I can imagine. And he certainly seemed that way when I met him. I think the same of Chris Hadfield, of course, who's kind of become the iconic Canadian astronaut. Um, but there's, there's neat stuff happening. And if I was smart enough um, and knew it early enough and was good enough at science, I probably would have become an astronaut, but instead I'm a librarian. So. <laughs> Well, everyone can't be an astronaut. Um, no, everyone cannot be an astronaut. There's a very, there's a very small pool. They're, they're, they're lucky people. I think that they, my impression mm -hmm. of meeting Mr. Trigvison was that, you know, he, he realized, as I think Chris Hadfield probably realized, that he had, has one of the coolest jobs in the, in the whole mm -hmm. world. So, yeah. um, It is a small number. All of the people who have ever been to space could sit at the same time in the library. That's amazing, yeah. Uh, it, uh, I guess uh, we've we've come to the end, so I've I've, I've been saying well, my goodbyes. Um, but before we, we thanks. yeah, and, th and thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you for being so accommodating uh, with my questions as well, because I know sometimes I'm asking things that are just a little bit out of ignorance, and you need to steer me towards the facts. So thank you for being so uh, such a good such a good teacher in these episodes, uh, and we look forward to working with you again. Uh, but for now, okay, we're we're too. all we're all done for astronomy okay. at home. It's been great. <laughs> Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, uh, please keep an eye out for any new things that we do together with Bill in future. Take care. Okay.